Lecture 10, The Beginning of the New Testament. And a connected question, is this a surprising turn of events? Or is this a continuation of the story that we've already seen? So where we left our discussion before was having traced the hope from beginning of the Old Testament until the end. And having seen the blossoming of that hope, it still left us with some questions. Now, to be sure, we rejoiced around much of the richness of the promises. We saw the beauty of how the Old Testament unveils the hope of the coming Messiah and everything that that means. And it, it raises our expectations to the highest levels. God does not just promise a mere deadening of the pain, that, that somehow the, the hardest pain will subside and then we'll continue on with a, a kind of a moderate existence, nor even that our existence will be better than it is now. But the Old Testament hope is that all of human sorrow will be set aside when the king comes and when he reigns. Peace will come to planet Earth. The world itself will be transformed. And of course, then, having raised our expectations to the highest level, then we have all kinds of questions about how this could be possible. And in so many ways, the Old Testament left us wondering about some of those questions. So, for instance, we wonder how it's possible for anyone to keep the high requirements of God in his law. We wonder if Israel, or the world for that matter, will ever enjoy the blessings recorded in Psalms and in wisdom. We wonder how to explain or even how to understand the high hopes for Israel, and then how those are dashed when Israel fails. And what do we do about hearts? Israel needs, we saw, a wise teacher, a righteous king. Israel needs a new covenant that will place God's law within their hearts. And in all of these respects, the basic question goes, how will the promised blessing come to fruition? Will God's promises be fulfilled or not? Of course, there were other details we wondered about. We wondered how this coming Messiah could both be human born and God from everlasting. We wondered how this one who would be born could both die and live forever as king. And some of these questions never really received an answer, such that we concluded with three metaphors that the Old Testament feels sometimes like a puzzle where the pieces aren't all there and you're kind of looking at it and trying to figure out what's left in the center, kind of a sense of some dissatisfaction or uh, 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 an archway that's being built and the keystone's left out, the two sides are gonna collapse unless you put in the last piece. And so the Old Testament can't stand unless there is a fulfillment that completes the picture. Or finally, we talked about the idea of a piece of music and the final cadence, the last bar, the last few notes, the final chords, they never come and it never resolves. This is where the Old Testament leaves us. When will he come? When will the solution arrive? And how can we even understand some of these promises? When some of them seem so impossible, our hopes have been raised to the highest level, and it creates in us a longing to see the fulfillment. Well, the beauty, of course, of the story is that it did come to fulfillment. And the exciting news of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, has come. The king, the messiah, the prophet, the priest, he has arrived, and that changes everything. You recall that a number of lectures ago, we noticed a, a kind of a grid for thinking about the Old Testament that begins in Matthew 1. I'd like to return back there and let's ponder that now as a transition or a hinge that brings us from the Old Testament to the New. The New Testament begins with these joyful words and the beautiful announcement that the Messiah has come and here is the record of who he is. This is the book of the genealogy, language we said that is very evocative or reminds us of Genesis. So it's a new beginning, a kind of a new Genesis. Here is the book of the generations of Jesus, and he is Jesus the Christ, 
Christ as a title, Christ as the Greek equivalent of the word Messiah. Hebrew Old Testament looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, Greek the New Testament now saying the same word just with different letters or a different sound, Christ the Messiah has come. And that Messiah is identified in two ways that are very significant. He is the descendant of David. He's the descendant of Abraham. Both of those, as we saw, because these are the recipients of very profound and significant promises in the history of the Old Testament. We observed then that there's a pattern as we proceed down through Matthew 1. And the pattern goes, as we look across this genealogy, a, a pattern moving from Abraham until David, moving then from David toward the deportation to Babylon, and finally moving from the deportation to Babylon down to the Messiah himself. And just to make sure that we understood that grid or that we understood the, the organization of this genealogy, Matthew himself will highlight it. All the generations from, here's the first section, Abraham to David. 14. David to the deportation to Babylon, 14. The deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14. And I'm going to argue here that at least one of the reasons for that organization, I think, highlights again these promises that we've talked about. Abraham. The promises made to Abraham with all of their significance, the importance of those promises, the seed who will be the blessing to the world. David, the promises made to David about his son that will be the king, the king without end whose dynasty will never come to a close. And the deportation to Babylon, remember what we observed is that the new covenant is linked to this, the Babylonian captivity, to say, no, God has not given up on his promises. In fact, he will make new promises, rich promises, the reminder, I think, in each one of these points of the great promises made, Abrahamic covenant, Davidic covenant, new covenant, all terminating in the Messiah. There's more we could say about Matthew 1. I'll just highlight one more detail that's very striking. We talked about briefly before that as you look through these genealogies, you find many conspicuous centers. And reminders of conspicuous sin, the history of Israel, of course, is full of it. And so, for instance, we see Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. This is that really troubling story where Judah accidentally goes in, not realizing it, to his daughter-in-law. And a little bit later, we're finding Rahab, and that then the descendant of, again, one who was taken out from the nations. But also, we're finding in here reminders of some hopeful, beautiful things, the story of Ruth. Yet even here, we're remembering that in the case of Ruth, she's a Moabitess. She's brought from outside of the nation. A bit later, reminders of David's conspicuous sin with Bathsheba. And some of the worst figures in the history of Israel, Manasseh, one of the most wicked kings in Israel's history. Okay, as you look then across this genealogy, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. And far from Matthew kind of whitewashing the genealogy or picking out people that would be the best character in order to try to make the picture look as good as possible. Matthew's just very open about it. Well, here are the people, lots of sinners, lots of sin. But the beauty of that is when we continue on, we discover the mission of what this person, the Messiah, will do. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What sin? What people? What kinds of wickedness will he save them from? And there are two ways that you can answer that question. You can go back to the story of the Old Testament, all of the books we've just worked through, all of the terrible history of Israel, and all of their failures and all of their sins. That, that sin, that failure. He came to save his people from their sins. Or alternatively, you can just look back to this genealogy. And the stories that are chronicled there, the memories that you have because of having worked through the Old Testament and seen all of the messy stuff that's gone on, that sin, he came to save his people from that sin. The Messiah has come 
and that brings us hope. Hope that the problem of sin will be dealt with. Hope that the questions and the anticipation of the, of the Old Testament now finds its complete fulfillment. But this itself raises a new and kind of interesting question, which is how we talk about the relationship between Old and New Testaments. Or to ask the question this way, is the Bible one book or two? I've emphasized as we've worked through the Old Testament and now as we've transitioned into the New, the deep connections between these two halves. I've argued, for instance, that the Old Testament has to point to the New. The Old Testament is not fulfilled apart from the New. But that could lead us, I think, to an invalid conclusion as well. We could so emphasize that the Testaments are one or that the entire Bible functions as one story, that we might miss something. And that is that there is distinction here. I mean, the two testaments are different. Now, let me talk about then some of the tension here. On the one side, there is certainly one faith, one gospel, one way of salvation, one story. And therefore, as we talk about Old and New Testaments, we ought to recognize that these two are both talking about the same God, the same realities, the same way of salvation. And yet now we're back to that question. Why do we then have two separate halves? I mean, why is it, after all, that when you open your Bible, there's a kind of a, a blank page or usually a title page, and it'll say on it, New Testament. Maybe we should just go continually between the two. Maybe Malachi should end and Matthew continues on and no one thinks of the two separate halves as separate halves. Why this distinction? Why make such a big deal about the differences? And I would like to support the reality or the fact that there is legitimate distinction here, that we're not wrong in recognizing the difference between the Testaments, most fundamentally, because Scripture itself recognizes the division. We won't look here, but Hebrews 8 puts a lot of emphasis on a distinction between the Old and the New Covenants, and that's where we get our language of Old and New Testaments. It's the reality that there are major differences that happened chronologically across the span of time. Paul, in Romans and Galatians, acknowledges that massive changes came about with the coming of Christ. And certainly we see also major changes in just the specifics of how we respond to God. How do we offer sacrifices? Do we obey the dietary laws? Do we view ourselves as the people of God as a nation? Or do we view ourselves internationally as the people of God spread across the world? Well, those are very significant differences, certainly in the experience of an individual believer and how they would then walk with God. So how to explain that or how to process that there is a difference here and yet that we're talking about one story and not two. That the stories are united organically. These are not separate stories that pull in opposite directions. But at the same time, we are absolutely talking about a distinction. How to process some of that. And one of the ideas I'd like to put into our thinking goes back to the argument I gave you earlier. Do you remember my concept with different metaphors? I talked about three, the archway, the symphony, the jigsaw puzzle. And in each one of these cases, there's something missing. Okay, the language I would like to build on that, or the way I would like you to think about Old Testament and New Testament, I would like you to think about the link between those two as the word fulfill. The New Testament fulfills the hopes of the Old Testament. And let's look at some passages that substantiate that. Then we'll work further to understand just structurally what this looks like and how it works. One of the most critical passages, if you were just going to remember one for thinking about the Old Testament, Jesus' words in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Think that I am not, not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay, if you only can remember a single word for thinking about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word fulfill will get you the furthest. The New Testament fulfills the Old. 
How about some of these other passages that just show you the deep links between the two? Luke 24, 25, talking to his, to his disciples, Oh fool, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. The prophets told you that the Messiah would suffer these things and enter into his glory. And so beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. When Jesus opened up to us the scriptures, they say, our hearts burned within us so that now when he appears the second time, these are the words which I spake to you that all things must be fulfilled. There's our language again. Those things which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And so Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he told them that it is written and it is necessary that the Christ must suffer, rise from the dead the third day, that repentance, remissions of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. All of this content contained in the Old Testament. Acts 3.18, God before showed by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, this has been fulfilled. The prophets give witness that all through, through his name, whoever believes in him would receive remission of sins. When they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down and laid him in a sepulcher. Jesus Christ was suffered these things and it was necessary that he would do so and rise again from the, step, from the dead. This Jesus is the Messiah. And he demonstrated from scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. I believe all the things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I continue to this day witnessing to small and great none other things than those which the prophets and Moses said should come because Christ is the end or a different way of saying it the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes the holy scriptures point to salvation the old testament scriptures point to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus my argument then across this broad litany of passages is that the New Testament testifies and points out what the Old Testament had already expounded. The Old Testament presents the Messiah. The New Testament shows you who that is. And the two then are deeply integrated. But there is a relationship. There is a difference. And that is the reality then, that the Old Testament points to his coming. And the New Testament shows how it is fulfilled. Let me show you another expression of distinction between the Testaments and, and another way of our recognizing how those two actually are organically related and show us this pattern of fulfillment. There's an interesting pattern and a difference that happens in respect to missions. By that, what I'm talking about is how people go out and convert or see other people brought to faith. And the pattern goes in the Old Testament it seems that the, the vision of this is that the people of God, or excuse me, that other people would be drawn to the people of God in Jerusalem. Do you see this kind of pattern in Isaiah 2 or Micah 4? The vision that people would be attracted to come. Come here, come and see, using that language. Well, moving across to the New Testament, I think you see a reversal of the pattern. And the pattern now is that the people of God go out. And so we could use the phrase, go and tell. Come and see, in the Old Testament, attractive, come here. And in the New Testament, spreading out. The people of God go to the nations. They go around the world to spread this news. Well, why would that be? I mean, there's a very significant distinction here, but why? And is there an explanation for what's happening? And I think the answer goes back on a deeper level to something fundamental about the entire shape of Scripture. Think about the Old Testament with me. And, and I think what you find in the Old Testament is the kind of narrowing shape. We did talk about the concept of increasing revelation, that in that sense, I would draw this diagram backwards. But in this case, I'm going across this way to say, as I proceed across the Old Testament, I'm learning more and more specific, specific information, more and more specifics about when, where, and how the Messiah will come. So in the very beginning, the initial revelation is just that the Messiah will come from Eve. Uh, technically speaking, that's everybody on planet Earth. I mean, she's the only woman on planet Earth, so if it's going to be a descendant, it's got to be from her. 
As the Old Testament unfolds, however, you find out more information. He won't just be a descendant of Eve, but he'll be a descendant of Abraham. Well, as you can see now, things have narrowed fairly significantly. Now I know more about where he's coming. He's going to come from the people that are called Jewish descendants of Abraham. Now, a good deal further down the line, from Judah, a descendant of Abraham, further on from David. Now we've grown very specific, and now I learn that he's going to be a king, but from a certain line of kings, from David's line, he will be a descendant of that man. And if I carried on further, I could discover things like where he would be born in Bethlehem. Daniel tells us when he will be born. So the effect of all of this is that the Old Testament has kind of a narrowing effect. I understand that the revelation is growing wider, but the narrowing effect here is to say your expectations are growing more and more specific. I see now when he will be, when he will come, where he will come, what dis, what line of people he will be descended from. And I think the pointer of the entire Old Testament is to say something like, look here, look here, right there. You could almost view the Old Testament as a, a great big red letter sign with lights on it saying, over there, over there, over there, over there. And it's raising your anticipation and hope about the coming of the Messiah. Now that's in the phase then of come and see, attracting people to come to Israel. Why? Because that's where the Messiah will be born. But if you turn this around now and you move to the New Testament, you'll find the reverse effect. In, in this case, the framework of the New Testament, remember moving outwards, I, I think is also reflected in the theology of the New Testament. I'll just take one example, but in the book of Acts, you will be witness, witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And what you're getting there is now God's people spreading out. Instead of God's people coming to one place, move outward, spread, go everywhere. And the difference between those are really strong. In the Old Testament, come here because the Messiah will be here. In the New Testament, go everywhere. Why? Because the Messiah has already come. There's no point now in waiting around in Jerusalem. Why spend your time in Judea hoping for, for the opportunity to see him? Why look for him in Bethlehem? He's here. He came. He returned into the, to the presence of his father. Go do things till he comes back. And the scope of the New Testament now is universal, international, everywhere, moving outwards. If I put these two then in parallel, side by side, I'm going to notice a very striking pattern. And, and that is that I think this is the best way to express the shape of the Bible itself. The Old Testament narrowing down, the New Testament widening outwards. And why would that be? Or what is the nature of that structure? Obviously, standing at the centerpiece of it all, and quite intentionally, is nothing other than the coming of Christ. Now, I'd like to build on that then a little bit, because one of the basic questions we asked was whether the Bible itself is made up of two books or one. And part of our answer ought to be, no, it's really one book. It's one story. The reason it's one story is because all of the lines in the Old Testament are pointing towards what event? Well, the Old Testament is designed to highlight this event. And likewise, all of the lines from the New Testament are pointing outwards, moving away or explaining the implications, the, the, the paradigm shifting reality of how important this was, telling the world what it means that he came. See, but even in that, what is the ground-shaking reality that transforms everything? And once again, it's none other than the cross. It has to be the cross. And in both cases, I think what you're getting then is a single message. And the single message is that the Old Testament points to this event, the cross. The New Testament interprets and tells you the implications of this event, the cross. Both stories are telling the one story, this event, is what changes everything. See, but see, that brings me then to talk about the contrast between the two events. And the contrast goes <clears throat> that there is a very significant difference between the two 
the Old Testament, as we saw, pointing inwards. The New Testament, as we saw, pointing outwards. This is an entirely different framework from this. A lot has changed. And there are other instances of this beyond just this specific framework. We could talk about things that we see across the book of Acts or how we relate to the law. Peter is astounded and confused when God tells him to go and eat some of these unclean foods. Well, Lord, I've never eaten anything like that. Why? Because that was part of the Old Testament law. And why then would that have changed? Why then do I no longer follow those dietary laws? Why do I no longer worry about the fabric of my garments? Why do I no longer worry about all of the other regulations governing the temple and the sacrifices? We'll see, that's back to the central event that stands at the core of the entire story of Scripture. The center of it all is the cross of Christ. And remembering then the structure of the New Testament, this kind of hourglass focus, the Old Testament pointing downwards to the cross, the New Testament expanding the implications of the cross, tell you exactly why everything changed. No, it's not a mistake. It's not a bug in the, the program of what God intended to do. It's not a charge thrown at us that we don't follow what God said in his word because we don't follow the commands of the Old Testament in this respect. This is not some kind of embarrassing mistake in the history of our book. Quite on the contrary. This is built into the structure of the book to show us that the coming of Jesus Christ changed everything. The coming of Jesus Christ, remember our word, fulfilled the expectations of the Old Testament. And so there are no more sacrifices. Those have been fulfilled. The people of Israel, the nation, and the way that the nation was to maintain its uniqueness among the nations, this has changed. It is continuing on in other expressions in the present, but yes, elements of that are now fulfilled. Why did those things change? Not just because we wanted to be rid of them, not just because we wanted to stop obeying certain commands, but because Jesus came and Jesus changes everything. I'd like to show you another expression of just how dramatic and significant the coming of Christ is, and even an expression of why the two Testaments are separate as we find them. We have looked at this before. It's just a simple timeline of the biblical books, and we're recognizing that the bulk of the books occurring here during the era of the prophets. Two phenomena I want to point out for you here, and one is just notice that there is a gap here between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. That's a, a gap of about 400 years. We'll return to that discussion in a little bit. But that's significant. So what's, what's happening in that gap? Is there any information or any history that we ought to know that's filled in within that gap? And the second thing I'd like to highlight is just notice the New Testament books and how quickly they come now. All of the New Testament books are written within a period of about 50 years. Wait, 50 years? That, in contrast to what we've seen in the span of the entire Bible, including all of this Old Testament history. And it's kind of striking and interesting that I don't have things stretched out like that when it comes to the New Testament. There's not a story to be stretched out and explained and considered. Well, why not? And I think, again, this is making the point. The coming of Christ changes everything. So that across the story of the Old Testament, as you wait and hope and long for his coming, there's a lot of history to be traced and how people look for his coming and whether they wait for it and how they respond. But once he has come, see, everything now begins to happen in a very rapid rate. Everything now is immediate. He already came. And all that remains then is to explain the implications of what it means. What is the significance of his coming? Know that and you know it all. Jesus Christ has come. That transforms everything. Now, on our way then to talk about the overview of the New Testament, I do want to pause and go back to this period in between. We sometimes refer to this as the intertestamental period. And so the question goes, what's going on in there? 
is there any significant history we need to know that relates to our own understanding of the New Testament? I'd like to stop and give two sides first. And that is the recognition that, yes, there is significant history that happened. There are events that matter. And it's helpful to know some of these events. It will, in some cases, color in or shape a little bit the way you think about certain things happening in the New Testament. On the other hand, I will go ahead and say that the Bible as it stands has given you the critical information you need to know. And we're going to talk about some history, and I think some of this will be interesting to you. I think it paints in some of the things or the details that have been left out, and I think we benefit from knowing it. But we do best reading the text of Scripture and understanding what Scripture itself presents, and then some of these details help us appreciate the richness of what's happening here. And part of the reason I mention that is to say that the core focus of the story the anticipation of the coming of Christ does have to it a bit of a rhythm here, a kind of a long pause. And I think that is intentional, that, that God did not record every century subsequently all the way up until the coming of Christ. There is the sense as you read through scripture that you're anticipating, waiting, longing, and then the story just kind of freezes. And for 400 years, there's a gap. Why? Well, I think it heightens even further your longing, and it heightens the awareness that this is a long pause while we're hoping for the coming of this Messiah who will give us the answer to the problem of the curse. If I was putting that, however, in terms of the events that did happen, life went on during that 400 years, here are some of the periods that you ought to know. You remember from the Old Testament storyline that Israel was taken into captivity in Babylon in 586. Well, 539 is the fall of Babylon, and Israel now falls under Persian rule instead of Babylonian. The height of the Persian Empire was massive, if you hear also the Medes and the Persians. And this control across a huge region included, of course, Israel. You've heard the name Cyrus. Cyrus, after taking captive Babylon, is concerned to get all of the gods and the peoples back to the places where they belong. And so he sends the group of Israelites who are here in Babylon, who were taken as captives, as exiles, he sends them back. And this is, of course, a very hopeful, joyful kind of thing. And that means that the temple is rebuilt in 516. And now there's the hope then that perhaps all of the hard period is done. Maybe Israel will be brought back to life again. Well, time continues onward. And in 333, a man named Alexander the Great, a Greek conqueror, comes through. He conquers Israel and he conquers much more with it. In the process, the full empire of Alexander spreads again across this entire region. Alexander suddenly dies in 323, and now his, his empire is divided up between four generals because he had no successor, and there was no plan set up like that. Those four kingdoms eventually develop into distinct kingdoms, and Israel falls at this point largely under the rule of the Ptolemaic kingdom. This is the blue here, if you want to say Egypt. This is one of Alexander's generals, their successors, a dynasty that continues on. And for several hundred years now, Israel is under that control. In 198, the Ptolemaic side of the kingdom has weakened until the Seleucids, the yellow part of this map, have expanded their control. And by 198, Israel is under them. If you know or are familiar with the prophecies of Daniel 10 through 12, you'll find back and forth talking about the king of the north, the king of the south. The king of the south is Egypt. The king of the north is the Seleucid king. And most famously and significantly, the king Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus reigns from 175 to 164. His empire, when he's now in control over Palestine, is bringing about some of the worst times for the nation of Israel. 
And specifically, Antiochus sets up what is remembered both in Daniel 9, in Daniel 11, and in Jewish history as the abomination of desolation. He actually offers a pig to Zeus in the temple as a way just of dishonoring the temple and making it a place that's blasphemous to the Jews. That's in 167. But that raises such foment and anger among the Jewish people that a new group of Jewish rulers or of Jewish soldiers come together, led by a man named Judas Maccabeus. Of course, this is a much later Renaissance era painting representing the victory. But Judas Maccabeus cleanses the temple in 164. That event is recalled all the way until the present celebrated in the holiday of Hanukkah. And you'll see it in John 10, 22, the feast of dedication. Jesus is going to be going up to this feast. By just around that time, 152, already some of the distinct groups are starting to be noticeable. Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes are starting to develop into separate groups. And we'll talk about that history in a moment. Around this same era, you also have the translation of the, the Old Testament into Greek. The Old Testament written in Hebrew, now tra translated instead into Greek. Over time, however, the Seleucid kingdom weakens. You remember, this is the northern kingdom, the kingdom that reigned over from the king of the north. Over time, as they weaken, these kings or these rulers, these Hasmoneans, the brothers and the later dynasty following Judas Maccabeus, start to take more and more position and control. And they do so under the name of being high priests. That should be a religious office. Actually, increasingly, this turns into more of a political office. And that creates some resentment. Now, they're able to maintain control. And Israel, at least, or the Jewish people, at least have some freedom. Things going on in the temple. There is at least a temple. They can at least offer sacrifices. And it's not being defiled by pagans. But there's also struggle. And the frustration reaches a point during the reign of one man, John Hyrcanus, until a group of original supporters break away. These people are called the Hasidim. And today we would know them as the Pharisees. People that now are resisting the rule of the Hasmoneans, these Jewish rulers like Judas Maccabeus, who had restored, but who kind of had taken control. And the Pharisees fighting back against them are the kind of the ones concerned with religious rightness. Let's not just make this a political reality, but let's actually make this a religious thing. Those who continue to work with the central power, the Hasmoneans, and just be concerned about political power are Sadducees. And you can see the roots of that extending all the way up until the New Testament era. Over time, these rulers are able more and more to increase the expanse of Israel. And in some ways, you can look at this and feel like, well, this is a positive turn of events for the nation. It nearly feels like they're getting back to some of the glorious days of the past when Israel had its own land and when they could rule themselves. As I've said, though, there's very little concern among the Hasmoneans, the rulers who followed Judas Maccabeus, his descendants, and those who followed in his dynasty. There's very little concern for religious propriety and following the laws carefully, and really more concern for just political power. They have become politicians in the name of being high priests. And just that is creating pressure and tension within the nation as what I said earlier, Pharisees versus Sadducees, the desire to see something closer to what God had prescribed in his law versus the desire just to hold on to political power. And eventually this reaches a point when they internally, certain Jews, invite the Romans to come and to fight back in this struggle for power between some of those who are trying to maintain control. The Romans take advantage of the opportunity, and this sets up the control of Rome over the nation, starting in AD 63. There's still power struggle back and forth in AD, or excuse me, 63 BC, 
In 40 BC, there's an invasion, the Parthian, Parthians take over for a brief time, and then the Romans come back and they set up Herod, who you'll recognize from the story of the New Testament. And Herod, who reigns all the way up until 4 BC, the Herod of Matthew 2, who killed all of the babies, that Herod is now set up by the Romans as a way to try to maintain the control. Herod dies. And under ruling, underneath the control of Rome, Herod now is seeing his kingdom, or Herod's kingdom now is split up under three of his sons. His three sons dividing up separate sections, but the part or the section of Judea was never really that submitted to the Roman authorities. And so the Romans eventually setting that aside, set up prefects instead to try to rule Judea and Jerusalem, one of whom is Pontius Pilate. If you keep on going now past the time of the Gospels, later on in the story of the New Testament, one other event you ought to know is AD 70. And that's the time when, because of some rebellions within the Jewish nation, the Romans come in, they destroy the nation, they destroy the temple. And never again then has the Jewish temple set upon that temple mount. Summarizing all of that again in one table, basically this simple summary of the story is that Israel continues to bounce back and forth, back and forth across this entire era. A lot of chaos, a lot of suffering, and yes, a lot of longing, longing for hope, longing for the Messiah, the Savior to come, to give them freedom, but primarily felt in terms of political freedom something that we'll see as we turn now to the New Testament. Clearly, just with the limitations of time and the reality of future lectures, we won't go through the major divisions of the New Testament right now in any depth, but I do want to give a quick flyover kind of summary of the big picture view of the New Testament, and starting with just recognizing the, the major sections of the New Testament. We've used this diagram for talking about the entire framework of the Old Testament and coming into the New. And now I'll move to this side, the four major stages of the New Testament. Here are the four periods that we ought to talk about. The life of Jesus recorded in the Gospels, the spread of the church recorded in Acts, the life of the church interpreted for us in the epistles, and finally Revelation, the grand victory, stretching all the way out into the future. And we'll talk later about how these pieces fit together and how we form the picture of the New Testament, how they all relate together. But for now, just a couple of points for each. Initially, the Gospels and the life of Jesus, declaring for us that the Messiah has come, the fulfillment of the Old Testament hopes for a prophet, priest, and king, he's here. And yet with all the joy of that, there are also some surprises. Remember my opening question for this lecture, the New Testament, is this a surprising turn? Or are these events that we could have anticipated? Well, there are elements of surprises and several. First of all, the Jews largely reject their Messiah. That's something you never would have anticipated reading across the Old Testament. Meanwhile, the Gentiles accept. Certainly there are ways you could look at the Old Testament and you could see that from the very beginning, this had been a pattern, people rebelling and not accepting the light. But who would have thought that the Gentiles would accept while the Jews turn away from their very own Messiah? A second major surprise, the Messiah will suffer and die. Now, again, if you were paying attention carefully in the Old Testament, you would see things like Isaiah 53 or Daniel 9, he will be cut off. But to read and to understand that the king, the eternal reigning king, the victor, the one who would bring freedom from the political control of all of these nations that throw us one direction and the other, that he would die and be apparently weak instead of a great victor? How did that come about? And a third surprise, the fact that there's a kind of a gap within the story of Christ coming. Again, we'll return to this, but as you read the Old Testament, you get the impression anyway that the Messiah would come and he would set up his kingdom and then he would reign forever. You're not expecting, on the other hand, 
that he would come, die, rise again, and then for 2,000 years at least, a long wait. Who saw that coming? And yet, there it is. The next phase in the story now is the spread of the church. This is the book of Acts. And we see the spread of the church going from Jerusalem centrally to Judea, Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the world. So it's an widening scope as the story of the book of Acts goes outward. And you see, again, an extension of the same pattern. Once again, it's largely Jews that reject. It's largely Gentiles that accept. And the surprise now here is that the new people of God, the church, the followers of Jesus, turns out to be a lot of Gentiles and a lot of not just people in Jerusalem, but churches across the Mediterranean world and beyond. That gets represented now in the epistles. And as we read across the epistles, part of the lesson given to us is that we're reading of churches in Ephesus and Colossae and Rome and talk in Rome of going out to Spain to preach the gospel there. And the spread of the gospel going to these churches, these are actual groups of people now established and worshiping Jesus Christ, not even a full generation after his death. But there are churches now dotting the Mediterranean world and people that are responding to him. And the core questions answered in the epistles then go, how should the church live out the reality of Jesus Christ and his victory? And Jesus Christ has come. He has been victorious. That has brought life. He has risen again. That changes everything. So what does that mean for us? How then do we live in a broken world? How do we live together as the church? How are we faithful as we live out the reality of who he is? You'll notice as you read carefully in the epistles that these are deeply pastoral documents. They're written to people for how to conduct themselves, how to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And that's the same for all of the epistles, but all the way to the last book. The final book of the New Testament, Revelation, is also a pastoral book. It's also written to seven churches. It also addresses them and tells them how they ought to live and how they ought to remain faithful until Jesus comes. And the conclusion of Revelation and the conclusion of the entire New Testament, the conclusion of the Bible, is that you must be ready. He's coming. He's coming quickly. And when he comes, he will deal with those who have been unfaithful. He will reward those who have been faithful. And so the New Testament ends with this message, I am coming soon. And until I come, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Let me go back then to the initial question I asked early and early in our lecture. Are we dealing with two books or one? Are we talking about the Old Testament, the New Testament as separate stories, or are they one story? And how integrated are they? And how much can we think about them as they're integrated? And a couple of final implications I would like to point out is that the framework of the New Testament shows you that immediately after Jesus' death and resurrection, everything has changed. The church is established now all across the world. People are going to live their lives out differently. All of reality has been transformed. And so the New Testament is tightly compressed within just a generation or two because we don't even need to wait for the long-term results to see how the story plays out. Jesus' death and resurrection immediately changes the world. It's also, as we've already seen, significant that Jesus can come back and will come back at any time. Why is the New Testament so compressed? Well, part of it is that you're not waiting for the long story of all of the events, a string of kings or rulers or a decline of a group of people. The point of the New Testament is to say, no, he can come back at any time. And immediately the New Testament is written, recorded. We're not waiting for the long story to play out. By the time the New Testament canon is closed, by the time Revelation is written around AD 90, it's already true. Jesus can return at any moment. We ought to be ready at any time for him to return. 
And the final thing I would like to observe about the relationship between the two books and just the framework of New Testament, Old Testament, and the story of the Bible is this phenomenon of the gap. Remember I said that Jesus has returned, he came, he died, he rose again, he returned back to the presence of the Father. Now we have this unexpected 2,000 year gap. And how do we process that? And the New Testament answers, this is a delay of judgment. He's coming back soon. So wait, be ready, because when he comes, he will hold his people accountable and he will deal with the wicked. Every day that elapses is an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to serve him. He's coming soon. And concluding then our introduction to the New Testament, the simple response of every believer is to say with longing, yes, even Lord Jesus quickly come. We long for his coming. We wait and hope, even as the Old Testament prophets hoped and longed for his first coming, we hope and long for his return. But in the meantime, the knowledge that he will return soon impels us and demands that we diligently work until he comes. And as we continue to understand the richness of the New Testament story, we will come to appreciate even more fully all of the implications of what happened. Jesus Christ has come. He died. He rose again. And that changes everything.